Yeah. For those who don't know me, I'm Mitch Resnick. And like a lot of other people in this room, my life was one that was transformed by Seymour Papert. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work with Seymour as a student at MIT, and then as a colleague of Seymour's at MIT. And now I'm you know, proud to have the title of the, the holder of the Lego Popper Chair at MIT. Um, and I want to talk today about what I was calling reviving <coughs> Popper's dream. So I think, again, many of us have been inspired by Seymour's dreams. As we heard from Cynthia and Brian and Artemis about Seymour's vision back in the 60s and 70s, and he laid out a dream of what life might be like for children in the future, of how children might have opportunities to use new technologies to be able to explore in new ways, experiment in new ways, express themselves in new ways. Uh, at the time, it seemed like a crazy dream, as was mentioned. Uh, did not many people believe the idea that everyone would have access and be able to use technologies in these ways. Now, 50 years later, we know that parts of that dream have become a reality. Indeed, people do have easy access to computers. Many children grow up around the world today with access to more digital technology than anyone would have imagined 50 years ago, uh, full of digital you know, the phones and, and game machines and laptops. On the other hand, another very, very central part of Seymour's dream is an unfulfilled dream, uh, as I think Gary was also mentioning. This idea of children using these new technologies to design, create, express themselves is something we often don't see today. Despite the proliferation of technologies, we see a lot of children browsing the web, playing games, chatting, texting, but not designing, creating, inventing with new technologies. They aren't really fluent with new technologies the way that Seymour imagined in his dreams. So a lot of our work is trying to keep alive that part of Seymour's dream of a world full of children who don't just use new technologies, but are fluent with new technologies, that don't just interact with technologies, but design, create, and express themselves with technologies. In trying to revive Seymour's dream, one project that we've worked on that Brian mentioned earlier was the, the Scratch Project. And this is a project we've worked on for a number of years along with Brian and some of the others here in the audience today, Natalie Russ, Shane Clements, and a whole group of us at the MIT Media Lab and other places have worked together to build this programming language for children that was building directly upon Seymour's work with Logo. We're trying to reimagine what would Logo be like if Seymour were inventing it in the 21st century. And how do we build on those same core ideas but connect it to children's lives today? Uh, that's what our aim was with, with in trying to create Scratch. And let's go to the next thing too. When children create with Scratch, they create projects by snapping together graphical building blocks, much like Lego bricks. And by snapping together blocks, putting together programs, in this case, create programs. Evidently, it's going okay, then. It's not on my screen, that's why. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's going okay. So I put together blocks there. In this case, they're controlling characters. Well, the screen, in this case, a game where a big fish eats a little fish. But then importantly, after creating the games, kids can then click on a share button and share it online, where it allow other people to play their games and to look inside and investigate their games, to learn from their games, to remix their games. In fact, we were very inspired by one thing that Marvin Minsky had said about Logo. He said, well, it's a nice grammar, but there's no literature. I mean, there was a great language to use, but you, when you learn to read and write, you're inspired by what others have done. And it wasn't easy to be inspired by the great works that others have done with the language. With Scratch, as people have shared their projects, there's now an online library of more than four million projects created by children around the world. You can see how others have created, learn and build on top of what others have created. I want to share a story about one young member of the Scratch community who goes by the username <laughs> MyRedNeptune. By telling her story, you get some sense of how children create and learn and share through Scratch, very much in that spirit of what I think is fulfilling a part of what I see as Seymour's dream. So if we look at the first project that My Red Neptune created when she was 12 years old, it was a project that she created as a holiday card. In this case, she programmed this so that as you click on each of the reindeer, each one, I guess we're not hearing the sounds, each one plays a different part of a holiday song. 
<laughs> so she was able to create this and then have other people be able to, she sent out the URL for other people to be able to play with her holiday greeting card. So this was one way that she was creating and sharing and being part of a community. But actually, as she created this, she found out that one of the things that she really enjoyed most was creating individual characters, or, we, or sprites, as it was called from the early days of Logo, uh, like these reindeer. So she started creating projects that were just a collection of animated sprites to share with others, whether it's horses and dragons and dinosaurs. But then importantly, as she put this online, she put project notes that said, if you like my, my sprites, please feel free to use them in your projects. If you want a different sprite, write to me, put a comment below, and I'll make sprites for you. So basically, she was offering her consulting services to the other two million members of the Scratch community. And sure enough, others started asking her to create sprites for them. So in fact, someone wants to have a cheetah in their project. So she went to the National Geographic website and found a video of a cheetah and made an animated cheetah that then someone else used in their project. Someone else asked for a sprite of a bird with flapping wings, so she made that. But the person liked it, but then said, actually, this is a nice bird, but I'd like to learn how to make that myself. Could you show me how to make that? So then My Red Neptune made another Scratch project that was a step-by-step -step tutorial that showed how she made the bird with flapping wings. This was then when we created Scratch, we figured that we would make tutorials and some teachers would make tutorials. We never realized that now kids would create thousands and thousands of tutorials, whether it's how to draw wings, how to make animations, how to make scrolling backgrounds, or even how to get your projects popular on the Scratch website. <laughs> there are tutorials about everything that kids are doing, sharing somewhat like an online Samba school, as Seymour had talked about, about a community of learners where people of all ages learning from one another, and also collaborating on projects. One last project I have from My Red Neptune. This is a project, a game she made with four other children from three different countries. It was a game where she did the characters, someone else did the music, someone did the backgrounds, someone did the gameplay. So together they did this and they started an online company called Crank Inc. where they started to promote their things and, and, and show off their projects to one another. So I think from this example you start to get some of the sense of how it's, it is possible for young people to use computers in the way that I think Seymour was imagining. To be able to use the technology not just to browse and to chat and to play, but to design and create, to invent, to share, to collaborate with one another. But we still have a lot to do in order to make this happen. We see examples online, but it's still a challenge. This is still outside the mainstream of the culture. I think what many of us here today are trying to do is how we can keep alive Seymour's dream to make sure that these ideas take root in the culture and continue to grow so we can really realize Seymour's dream. I'll just end with a story from a couple years ago when I was giving a talk about some of these projects. And after my talk, Someone stood up and asked in a somewhat aggressive tone, they said, wasn't Seymour Popper working on these things 30 years ago? And he meant it as a criticism. <laughs> I took it as a compliment, and I said yes. Um, and in fact, you know, yes, we are continuing to work on those same dreams. Seymour's dreams are not easy ones to fulfill. It will take many of us a long time to continue to try to fulfill the dreams. You know, but I think you know, it's something that I'll feel very proud to spend the rest of my life trying to do that. Thank you very much.